This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Like, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The parasite in my head was already saying, this is your fault, you must have led the guy on. I was 11. I was 11, I was 11, I was fucking 11. So this one year of, abu- one year of grooming and then this night of abuse... Um, planted a seed in me or planted a parasite in me that you know may, may have been a tiny thing at the age of 11 I may have been only that much out but by the time I was 40 I was off the grid I started to batter people I started to humanize people I didn't really understand karma I thought I was doing a good job I didn't realize that every person I hit was you know was something I'd have to pay for later on it was a demolition job very quickly but I but I'd held in so much rage because I was trying to change that I just destroyed him and when he was unconscious someone picked him up to try and carry him to the car and I hoofed him as hard as I could in the head I couldn't stop myself I was gone and then I heard people saying he's dead he's dead they couldn't get him around they dragged him to the car the toes of his shoes were scratching on the floor and I just remember feeling even my friend Seymour who was with me this guy's a veteran, you know, he's one of the most experienced guys you could ever meet. Even, even he looked worried, even he said, oh, I don't know what you've done, he was like this, you know. And I remember thinking, that's it, it's over, it's gone. I'm going to lose my liberty, I'm going to... Uh, I've still got this background of faith and I'm thinking I'm going to lose my place in the hereafter. I knew, I, I knew something had ended, I knew this guy was going to die and I was never going to be able to recover. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got martial arts expert, Jeff Thompson. How are you, brother? Very good, thank you. First and of I all, just what? wanted to say thank you. You've yeah. been so accommodating mm-hmm. and so kind. I just wanted to say thank you. It's, uh, it's, it really makes a difference to me, so thanks, yeah. James. No, I appreciate that. All, first of all, thank you to you as well for taking the time and coming here. I think this is the earliest we've ever done a podcast. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's seven in the morning, but um, you've got a great story, brother. You've wrote 50 books now. Yeah. You're a martial arts expert. You have worked with some of the biggest names in the world. You as eighth dan, yeah, which is one of the highest rank ever. Yeah, it's a it's a high rank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. up there with Bruce Lee. You Lee's get to a certain level, and they just those grades are thrown at you. Yeah, as you know, you get to a certain mm-hmm. level where they don't mean anything. Mm-hmm. They don't mean anything outside the chip shop on a Friday night. Yeah, if you can't have a fight, it means nothing at all. But it, but it, it the fact that it doesn't mean something means something to me. You know, so it becomes something that will open the door and get you in somewhere, but mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything if you don't know who you are. We were talking at the beginning about who am I. Unless we know who we are, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know who's doing it. 
We don't know who, who we're feeding. We don't know who we're giving the drink to. We don't know who we're doing the drugs for. We don't know who we're, we're trying to be validated by. You know, so we've got to know who we are. That's yeah. our singularity. So for me, it's the, the, it's the sense that, you know, once I know that, once I've got that singularity, that self, that's my only point of reference. And someone asked me the other day, you know, I mean, that's great. You know, you've, you're awake, but, you know, how, how often do you fall? And I said, wow, fucking every day. Every day still, I still fall. But St. Francis fell every day still. He just got back quicker. St. Columbia fell every day. You know, the Buddha and, you know, Angulimala, all of these great saints, you know, we get this idea that we get to a point and we don't fall. When we're human, we fall. We just, re we just return to the center quicker. We protect the center. You know, that's our sanctuary, that's our ark. But when we get back to it quicker, if we do fall, but we still fall. And that's why it's not healthy if we've got gurus in the world who seem like they are impervious and, and untouchable and they don't make mistakes because it sets an example in a human body that we can't meet. It's not, it's not that we shouldn't feel temptations. It should just be that we learn to recognize the wrong signature and either rebuff it or bring it in and convert it to something beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm only interested in leaving a beautiful message for somebody, which yeah. I know is, I know is what you're yeah, that's what to I want well. to get across as well. And it's to understand we all make mistakes and perfection doesn't exist. Like you said there, you found yourself. How long did it take you though to do that? Because a lot of people in life, so many distractions and pain, struggling. Yeah. And it is difficult to really work within and try and identify who you really are. How long did it take you, Jeff? Well, you know, it, I would say, I would say the big turnaround was when I got my fifth done many years ago, which is classed as the master grade. And I just, you know, I was quite full of proud pride and just thought I'm there. And then I looked in the mirror and I saw this fat, overweight um, bully. You know, it was very hard, very hard to see it. Very hard to look at this guy that's still bullied, even bullied my wife, it was subtle. I love her bones, you know, I love her very bones, but it was, and it was subtle, but you know, if she didn't want sex, if she, you know, I leaned into her and she didn't want to cuddle, my insecure self would slam doors and give her a cold back in bed. And when I realized that, when I realized that my friends loved me, but they were afraid of me because I was a hair trigger, because I was like I am now, I was polite, I was articulate, but I had such a sensitive underbelly that if someone, if I felt someone had dissed me, I could go into a, a violent rhetoric very quickly, you know. I was, I was no Kissinger, you know what I mean? I, w I wasn't about negotiating over the table. If, if someone affronted me, it would play in my mind until I became physical. And then when I became, I became very good at being physical. But I realised how limiting that was. So for me, it's been this, when I got to my fifth dam, I've been building up. I was a lump. I was about 16 stone. I was, I was... Uh, a black belt in lots of systems. I was training in wrestling, Greco-Roman, freestyle, collegiate, you know, hook and catch, catch as catch can, some of the very ancient, dangerous stuff, Greco. I was training in all these arts, boxing. I was training with professional boxers. I could have a fight, but that was the limit of it. But at the fifth dan, I bumped into Budo, which is the esoteric end. And that said, yeah, you've done well to get here. And, um, and this grade is because, this grade is not just because of what you've done, this grade is because what you're expected to do now. So I went from expanding to having to contract. In Christian mythology, they would call this apophatic theology. Sounds fancy, but it just really means we get rid of everything that isn't God, or we get rid of everything that isn't self. So I didn't really know who I was, I knew who I wasn't. I'm not a bully. I'm not violent. I'm not jealous. I'm not psychotically jealous, which I was showing signs of that. You know, I'm, I'm not um, uh, greedy or envious. I'm none of those things. That was, that was something I absolutely knew. So through this process of negation, I, I contracted myself in order to allow my consciousness to expand. You said something very interesting when we were talking before. It's painful. And people have this idea that the spiritual path is <laughs> socks and sandals 
and, and dream catchers yeah. uh, and, and, and athletes. <laughs> and it's just not, it's, it's yeah. so painful. Mm-hmm. Someone said to me recently, what does it feel like to be woke? I said, it feels painful because I know my own errors and, not, and I know other people's as well. I see their masks, I see their agenda. I don't judge it, I just see it. It's painful to see it when, you, when, when it's someone you're lying in bed mm-hmm. with. It's painful when you see it when it's your mum or your best friend. It's painful when you see their shadow and they don't see their shadow. You know, their, you, know their, who, you know them more than they know themselves. Yeah. So I started to look and, and I just felt so ashamed and felt so weak. I recognised that I got this big carapace, all this war paint. I was covered in tattoos. I got the armour. I got this huge back and I could have a fight. I was curling 220. You know, I was a really, I was physically really strong, but underneath there was this frightened kid knew I was going to be caught at any minute. I just thought, people, are, how are they not seeing it already? It was there. I didn't want to look at it. So I had to start contracting. I had to start letting go of the violence, letting go of the armour, letting go of the big body frame, letting go of the need for validation, the need for peer review, you know, the need for somebody to like me, the need for somebody to, to say my work is good or whatever. All of that stuff disables me. All of that stuff makes me a prisoner. I'm not interested in that. I've no interest in it at all. What I'm interested in <clears throat> is connecting to my soul or my singularity or my, the quantum vacuum, the, the point of reference, whatever you want to call it, the self, finding that. And I'd seen it a few times. I bumped into it. I wanted to find that and I wanted to sit in that. That's the very centre of my arc and I wanted to be able to go out into the world and see the suffering of other people, not contribute to the suffering by being clumsy and unkind and belting everybody that doesn't agree with me, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I was doing, <laughs> and um, just going, I want to plant seeds of kindness everywhere. And, mm. and people have got this idea that, you know, that's soft, but it's actually the most difficult thing to do. If you want a strong esoteric exercise, just be kind today, yeah. just today. Don't gossip about people. Mm. Don't, don't sit wanking off over Donald Trump because he's mm-hmm. such a beast. You know, he's just a representation of, he's the face of, he's the face of modern society. Yeah. He's a projection of, of what's in everybody. So yeah, he's just saying, yeah. be kind. I love that because I don't know if you're a lot of bad men, but they ain't bad men. The bad man is the one who's wanting to show their vulnerabilities, the yeah. one who's willing to yeah. show how dishonest they've been and how much pain they're in. Yeah. That for me is strength. That for me is the person who you should be looking up to. And a lot of people have changed their life, but it is difficult to go within and actually identify that, okay, I am struggling. Okay, I need help. Is, we've got so much pride. We've got so much pride that we're ashamed to admit we're hurting. Yeah. But once you start seeing other people hurting as well yeah. And, yeah. and pain, then you realise, wait a minute. Okay, if he can speak out, I can speak out. And it's that's why always try and make people it's easy for anybody to sit here and, and glorify their good things i've done this amazing i've did that but let's talk about the pain yeah. let's talk about the struggles how you actually went what you actually went through to get to where you are yeah. today it's it's a beautiful thing and you should be proud of everything you've achieved brother Thank it's you. Un, honestly you. unbelievable we'll touch on all that now we'll go right back to the start jeff yeah kind of where you grew up and how it all began yeah well i grew up i had this massive energy i had this chi this key you know, this universal energy racing through me um, and I was going to do things, you know, I could feel it. I was a bundle, you know, I was going to be a footballer, you know, I wanted to write even from an early age, but it got interrupted at the age of 11 when I was sexually, when I was groomed and sexually assaulted by a teacher. So it, it took my energy, took my will and it captured it, it stole it. So this one year of, one year of grooming and then this night of abuse um, planted a seed in me or planted a parasite in me that I, you know, may, may have been a tiny thing at the age of 11. I may have been only that much out, but by the time I was 40, I was off the grid. You know, I was miles and miles out. I was abusing, self-abusing. I was abusing myself physically and sexually. I was abusing people violently you know, with the, on the doors. Um, I had very strong but false beliefs that the world was dangerous and I needed to protect myself. I was psychotically jealous. You know, most of the most of my self abuse was going on in the dark when no one was looking. I wasn't even aware I was abusing. I wasn't even aware that was happening. 
I, I couldn't trust my family. If my wife went out of the room, on my worst days, if she went out of the room, I felt she was betraying me. You know, I couldn't trust my family, especially my family. This is how I felt. This person who I idolized when I was 11 had said to me, the world can't be trusted. Nobody can be trusted, not even the people you love, especially the people you love. That set a parasite in me that fed off me for the next 40 years. So part of me was abandoned during that night and another part of me grew. So this parasite in me grew. And I didn't see this guy probably for another 30 years, but even over time and space, even though we were disparate, he was still feeding from me. So we, we are bonded to the people we hold resentment for. So I had a lot of anger there, a lot of confusion, a lot of dissonance. Um, and instead of looking at that or instead of capturing that, if it had been captured when I was 11, I think that parasite could have been removed very quickly and the damage would have been you know there would have been a lot less damage because it wasn't because i was brought up in an irish catholic family where we do not talk about shame you know shame is an assassin's bullet we hide from it and if anybody you know brings shame to our door you know it's, it's like death to us so you don't bring shame to the door that was our big thing so i couldn't talk about it i couldn't share it I couldn't say to somebody, this has happened to me, so that, they, so that they could retract it. When I finally did share it, the people I shared it with didn't know how to react. They didn't know how to deal with it. So they reacted in the same way I reacted when I woke up in the middle of the night with a heavy, hairy, invisible hand from behind, all over my genitals, all over my body. They reacted with terror. They reacted with um, stilted shock. They were dissonant. They were cold, they were distant. So in my juvenile mind, I'm thinking, I've shared this, and all I saw was um, blame. This is your fault. The parasite in my head was already saying, this is your fault. You must have led the guy on. I was 11. I was 11, I was 11, I was fucking 11. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a, a line from my play when the characters, I did a play about this called Fragile. Which one up after? Uh, this was a stage play, yeah. it was, it was um, the, it wasn't. It wasn't a film, so it was mm -hmm. a stage play. The, the one that won the BAFTA was a film about called Brown Paper Bag. Mm -hmm. But there's a line in it where someone accuses him of leading this guy on, and he says, "But I was 11. 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 I was 11 years old. I was a boy. I was 11." He's repeating it again and again because he's dissonant. He's confused. He's going, mm -hmm. "What do you mean? I've, I've hardly kissed a girl yet. I don't, wouldn't know what that means. Even I don't know what that means." So there's a tremendous feeling that family, society are blaming the victim. It's your fault. Somehow it's your fault. No smoke without fire. I'm 11, you know. So that's what created most of my rage, you know. Mm. I mean, I can feel it now. I can feel the emotion. But Did you end up hating yeah. on your family because they wouldn't understand and wouldn't give you the loving care that you needed at that I, age? I How love, old were you when you says that? This, I, 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 I shared it when I was probably 12 or 13, a couple of years. So very close. To yeah, so very close. Um, and this is not in any way blaming people. This is just saying people don't understand. They are terrified. I understand fear. So people were afraid. But, but the, the, the thing was, that created even more resentment. It created even more belief that nobody could be trusted. I was wrong. People can be trusted. You know, and I think... People, are, people just don't know how to deal with these things. My reason for telling this story is, is to encourage people to share their story and to find someone that will listen. So if the parasite goes in, they can bring it back out again, rather than it grow in them and then create destruction. Mine came out because I started to write books and plays and films and articles that, I, that explored it. I wanted to understand it. I, there's no way I was going to blame my parents or blame uh, God or blame the police. I was too afraid to do that. So I just kept this in, inside. I was quietly angry. You know, I was full of rage. But rather than say I'm angry at my mom or I'm angry at my dad or I'm angry at this teacher, I displaced it and I was angry at society. So I didn't say that. I was too afraid to that because I love them so much. Um, and it was only when I did the play, Fragile, that I wrote it, that I started to explore it, that I realised it was nobody's fault. It was just a confluence of circumstances that put me somewhere. And although 
um, this situation happened, it, it led me onto a path I would never have gone onto if it hadn't have happened. There's no way I would have followed the path I followed. And the path, of, path I followed was a path of investigation. I've gone heavily into psychology, heavily into physiology, heavy into sociology, very, very heavy into the metaphysics to explore why, is, why have I got this pain. So when I wrote Fragile, that was like an exorcism. We actually had Samaritans at the door every night for that play because it was so visceral and so true. And you think, I'm going to write this play and I'm going to talk about, not about the abuse, but about what happens after the abuse. The fact that there's a parasite in you, the fact that you can't trust your own fingers, the fact that when nobody's looking, you rape yourself and you don't know why you're doing it. You know what I mean? That's very painful to say, but the only way, the only way I'm going to clean that is by revealing it and putting it on paper and letting an audience see it, letting an audience help me to clean it and say, I'm not going to be ashamed of something that's been done to me and that's continuing to be done to me. So I started to write about this and I went through the layers. I realised I wasn't really angry at my mum. I just wanted to protect her. I wasn't angry at my dad. I just wanted to protect him from this shame. I wasn't really angry at the, this teacher. He was a victim himself, you know. Everybody, everybody who commits a heinous crime is a victim of something, of his circumstance, of his background, of similar abuse, of historical, you know, uh, uh, abuse, you know. You know, you've got these black kids at the moment who are still struggling because of slavery, still struggling because they're over-policed and they're over-prisoned and, you know, they're, they're looked down on because of something that happened hundreds of years ago. Everybody is a victim of something. So the idea was, I, when I went through the ledge and really looked at it and really shouted at my mum, shouted at my dad in the play through this character, shouted at this teacher, shouted at this fat copper, who only seemed to be interested in, did you enjoy it? Did you get an erection? Like it's, you know, like somehow, I've, I've, again, I've led him on. But when I got past all that, I just thought, these people, these people don't know what they're doing. They're just afraid. People are just afraid. They don't understand. And I realised I loved them. I just loved them. And I didn't really have any anger. But it wasn't until I wrote about it and watched it perform that I realised I'm not angry at them. Who am I angry at? And of course, I realised I'm angry at God. So I'm brought up a Christian, and I'm lying in this bed in the middle of the night. So why has God let that happen to me? So I say to God, uh, he's, God says to me, I'm starting this conversation, this internal dialectic. He says, you think I abandoned you? I said, yeah, I do. Now, if you think I was afraid to, say, to blame my mum, you can imagine how much more I'm afraid to, um, you know, to blame God, who's omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. But I said, yeah, I do think you abandoned me. And he just, there was a stillness. And he said, I didn't abandon you, but did you abandon you? And then it hit me. Of course I did. This thing happened. It was a confluence of circumstances. The parasite wasn't drawn out of me. And from that day onwards, I abandoned myself in every way for the rest of my life until I started to write about it, until I started to go inside and exercise this team, and that's what I did. Was that your therapy then, putting yeah. it in paper and putting yeah. it in a play? Was this guy your instructor? He was a martial arts instructor, yeah. yeah. Um, so your trust went from not just him, but your yeah. family as well. You, yeah. For anybody watching, we'll touch on this subject, for anybody watching that's maybe came forward already and people have already palmed it off as if it was nothing to forget it, what advice would you give them for someone that's been abused mentally, physically, what strength or what words of advice would you give for them? Well, we're, as they say in AA, we're only as sick as our secrets. So reveal it. Talk to somebody. Even if you just talk in your own sub-vocalisation, if you just write it down and burn it afterwards if you want to or reveal it to somebody that you can trust. But the main thing is that, it, that it's, it's like a seed. It grows in the darkness and it will give you all sorts of projections of shame. I thought when I wrote Fragile, I would lose my wife. I'd lose my agent, I would lose my income, people would think I was disgusting, because I felt disgusting, I felt vile, I felt like shit under the shoe of society. That wasn't what I presented, I presented as this, you know, this together guy, but, I, but I, that's what I thought. So I said, okay, this is what's blackmailing me. Every time I wanted, to, no, no one knew about this, even my wife didn't know about the stuff that I was doing. So I just said, look, I've written this play. Um, and the terror when I come to put the play on wasn't, uh, really, all of those things. There was the the the, um, the terror was that my mum would see the play, 
and that she would be hurt by it, that she would that in somehow I'd bring shame to her door. So that was a very powerful imagery that I've got. So that was the only thing I was really, really afraid of. Um, so when the play went on, I'd, all I did in my meditation and my prayers is said, look, all, I, all I'm interested in is protecting my mum. I don't want my mum hurt. This is nothing to do with her. This is me cleaning out a parasite that's feeding off me, and I want to get rid of it. So writing about it, writing about the detail, which was the most difficult thing I've ever done, absolutely the most difficult, talking about how my will had been taken over, you know, so my kingdom had been stolen, um, and how um, every time these lusts met me, they would take over my body, and, and I felt possessed by it. So I wanted to write down all of the detail, all of the wild imagination, all of the stuff my brain was trying to do to try and balance it, all of the stuff that nobody wants to talk about, all the stuff that I'd read everywhere that nobody would talk about. So I just said, OK, I'm going to write it down and let's just see what happens. This, these were my blackmailers. I'm going to bring them to light. I'm going to expose them to light. And if my theology is right, they will be consumed by the light. And they yeah. were. It's unbelievable that you can speak about it um, so openly and freely and it will help so many others. Is that the reason why you became one of the most... Um, one of the biggest martial artists in the world because... Was that a protection? But you wanted to learn how to fight. Was yeah. that to protect yourself, yeah. shield yourself? I could yourself. kill in thirty languages. Yeah, it's funny that um, <laughs> you've got how many black belts have you got in so many different things? I've lost count now, loads. So, so loads. you've got, yeah. but you actually met your abuser. Yeah, thirty years down the line. Yeah, and a man who can kill in seconds. Yeah, how was that feeling to see him? What was that moment like? Because I know you didn't even do anything. Well, this is at that point when mm -hmm. I. Was, I'd got my fifth down and I was starting to realise I needed to work inwards. I knew I was strong externally, but I knew I was weak inside. I knew I'd got no centre. I wasn't connected to myself. There was a disconnection, which meant I was weak, even though I presented as strong. So I was starting to look at Buddha. I was starting to look at, um, in, in Islam they call it the, the greater jihad, the internal battle. There's the lesser jihad, which is the external world where we try and roll up our sleeves and fix it, and then there's the greater jihad. So I was working in, inwards. So I was starting to think about things like forgiveness as a metaphysical power. And then one day I was just sat in this cafe um, at the height of my physical prowess, um, and I looked across, and there he was, just me and him in this cafe in Coventry. So serendipity had placed this together. And it was like the universe was nudging me and saying, what are you talking about? Metaphysical power. Let's have a look at it now. And believe me, I had a lot of physical skills and they just fell off me like an old coat. I looked over and I was 11 again. I was trembling. My, I could feel the adrenaline in the soles of my feet and on the crown of my head. And everything in me wanted to run, run, run. Nobody will know. Nobody even knows you've met this guy. He doesn't even know who you are. Uh, but I would know. So I had a chance to do something really brave. I knew the physical skills wouldn't work. I knew that I could go over and do the physical skills and I could do damage to him, but that would just feed whatever parasites inside me. The only way I was going to um, defeat this guy was, with a, was with, a, with a remedy, with an attribute, and the attribute is compassion. Compassion means looking at the whole picture, recognising I absolutely, unequivocally knew what this guy was going to have to go through. At this moment in time, he was feeding from me. There was, a, there was a, an intravenous tube between me and him, and even though we were disparate, he was feeding. Because every time I thought about him, anxiety. Every time I thought about him, rage. Every time I thought about him, all sorts of uncomfortable, unwelcome feelings. He took over my endocrine system. He had more control. He went into the, my kingdom. In the Old Testament, they called the kingdom the land, enter the land. And the, the root word of land is will. So when they say we've got to find the kingdom of God or we've got to enter the land of God, they're talking about entering your own will. This guy had stolen my will and he took over my will and he got, he got me to do awful things. I mean, I, you know, you know the story. I battered mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I recognise at this point that this, this, unless, unless I severed this connection, um, unless I broke this connection, if I was violent with this guy in any way, it would have carried on feeding the parasite because the parasite feeds off pain. It feeds off violence. Mm -hmm. 
the, as Eckhart Tolle says, pain bodies feed off pain. Yeah. They feed off other pain bodies. They feed off drama. So if I was violent with this guy, I was going to feed what was in me, even though that might be satisfying. It wasn't satisfying to my soul. It was an abuse to my soul. So I recognized I had to forgive him, but I was trembling. And I was full, of, I could have gone either way. I was so full of rage and emotion. I was nearly crying. And I, I, it was like climbing out of a dugout and going across no man's land. That's how it felt. And in psychology, they say to you that confronting our schemas, confronting our inner demons, is, they said it is the equivalent of going into war with a bayonet. That's how real it feels. So these kids out there who feel disproportionately terrified, they feel terrified because they, they, they are, when they're facing these schemas, these, uh, this damage, they are, just feel like they're facing death. So I recognized, that, I recognized in retrospect that when this guy abused me, he stole something from me. He stole my will. He entered my kingdom, took my will. And in its place, he left the hot coals of trauma, of abuse. So he left a parasite. And that parasite stole my will, at will, uh, whenever it wanted to, and fed off me. And I recognized there was an opportunity here to... Um, take that, what he'd stolen, and take it back, back, yeah, and give him back the hot coals. That's what it says in the Old Testament, uh, St. Paul. Vengeance belongs to me, and I shall repay. So if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shall heap coals of fire on his head. And it's a beautiful parable, but what it actually means is that vengeance doesn't belong to the individual. We haven't got, we haven't got the power to do that. Vengeance belongs to reciprocity. You know, to the law of compensation, cause and effect. So give it over to reciprocity. And if, you're, if they're hungry and if they're thirsty, in other words, if they're looking for truth, if they present themselves and they're ready for truth, the, the food and the drink is, is giving them truth, giving them pure truth from faith. Give them that. In so doing, the, the, the hot coals of uh, abuse that they've given you, the parasite that they've plant, planted in you, you give back to them. So we should chase the people who have hurt us and we should serve the people who have hurt us because they have something of ours and we need it back. And although it's very tempting to be angry and to be violent and 20 people will tell you how well you've done, you know that you've just fed something that you're trying to get rid of. So I, I didn't realize that at the time, in retrospect, when I studied, I realized, I knew, I knew I'd done something powerful because he just collapsed. And then he put his hand out and he wanted to shake my hand, but his fingers were trembling. And I knew, I innately knew what he meant. What he was doing when he put his hand out and he wanted to shake my hand was he was saying, we've got this bond, it's unholy. I'm feeding off you, you're feeding off me. Something bigger than us is feeding off us. This, uh, what Aurobindo would call the, the adverse forces, this negative energy that roams the atmosphere, it's feeding off us. And I'm going to I'm going to accept your forgiveness and I'm going, to let my, I'm going to let you separate from me and then I will face reciprocity and you will be free to heal. So I'll be free to repent, you'll be free to heal. And that's what happened. And I knew, that's what, I knew that was what was going on innately. I absolutely knew it, but I couldn't articulate it at the time. So me forgiving him was nothing to do with him. It was to do with me letting go of the anger, the pain, the fear, the dissonance. And so I could start to heal. And then I, I think I said to you, I think you probably read, but then some years later I heard that he killed himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he took himself to London, he hung himself in a hotel room. And I, I'd been healing a lot by then, and I have just felt this tremendous compassion, because at some level I recognised that. I, I knew when I forgave him that he would have to face this, and I knew how painful that would be. Because when, as you said earlier yourself, you're one of the few people I've spoke to who actually openly admits how painful it is to repent how painful it is. Uh, repent means to repair. It means to return to the center. It means to find refuge. It's very painful because we have to go past all the dead bodies of our past. Mm -hmm. We have to go, we have to dig up all of those bodies yeah. under the patio. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, but if we can do it and we yeah. can present ourselves and say, these are the things I'm ashamed of. Yeah. These are the things that blackmail me. I know you think I've let that guy off, but I haven't. I've given him over to the fires of reciprocity. And took your power back. I've took my That's power back. That's a brave thing to do. So for people, including myself, who sometimes thinks about revenge, sometimes thinks about killing people, sometimes yeah. thinks about um, how happy would you be if you seen someone who had done you harm in pain. Yeah. That is them feeding off your... Yeah. 
as you say it, what's that you say? The, the uh, parasite. The parasite yeah. in you. So to break that connection, to break that chain, what is it you've got to do? Forgive and let go? You've got to, first of all, you've got to understand it. We have to understand what forgiveness is. <clears throat> we think we've got the power to forgive. Mm. We think we have the power of revenge. We don't. We don't have that power. If I act, enact violent revenge on somebody, all I'm doing is feeding the parasite, creating karma, which I'm going to have to look at again. At some point, if I'm violent with somebody, if I kill somebody, at some point, I've got to clean that. It's in the plumbing. Yeah. I can't justify it. So um, this, this compassion is actually a remedy. In Islam, they call it an attribute. They say it's an attribute of God. So it's a remedy. It's like, a, it's like a, um, an antivirus. So we have a virus in us. We have a parasite in us, and compassion, forgiveness, in other words, giving it over, mm -hmm. is a remedy to that. So we have to understand that karma settles its own accounts, always. You know, nothing goes unmissed. Nobody goes unpunished. Nobody goes unrewarded. That's basic scientific cause and effect. Mm -hmm. It's the law of compensation. So we have to understand that. We hold on to grudge because we think we have the power to forgive. We don't. We have the, fa the power to give it over. We can only give it over if we understand it. If I believe in karma, if I believe in cause and effect, and I know that giving it over, he will have to settle his own accounts yeah. with that force, then I've got more reason to do it. If I know that giving it over frees me, if I know that it frees me, it gives me more reason to do it. If I know that being angry and engaging anger and engaging violence feeds anger and violence, feeds him and feeds this negative force that's around. Whether people want to acknowledge it or not, there is a negative force in the universe, in the world, that's constantly attacking, constantly trying to find holes in loose tiles so it can weed its way through. Mm -hmm. Mine weeded its way through when I was 12 and it grew in me till I was probably 40. And when I started to see it, by looking at it, by writing about it, by exposing it to light. And when we talk about light, I'm talking about exposing it to, you know, actually looking at it and getting some intelligence about it. So I gave this guy, I gave this guy back the hot coals of his abuse. He went off and killed himself. I felt compassion when he killed himself because I knew I'm intelligent enough to know that nobody commits a crime, a heinous crime, unless they are possessed by some false belief unless they are a victim of some false belief i've visited kids around prisons all around the country you probably have yourself i've not met one yet who wasn't either abused when they were a or kid bullied. or bullied when they were a kid i did a talk at one prison and it was for 50 lifers and every single one of them without question had father issues absent father violent father you know um mm -hmm. abusive father um, they, all, they, they were all victims. I looked at them, and the reason I could talk to 50 lifers, murderers, drug dealers, um, paedophiles, all sorts of every crime you can imagine, the reason I could look at them without judging them is because I knew I'd been a criminal. I knew I'd been a victim to this force myself. But I also knew that if I could recognise this force, recognise that it is an evil force, but it can be converted to good, you know, a bit like a light bulb, you've got a, you've got a negative element, you've got a negative mm -hmm. po uh, pole positive. and a positive, and then you've got the element in between. So the negative and the positive are impotent without, without, without this thing in the middle. So this element in the middle creates the light. So the element in the middle is our will. So if I take the negative and combine it with the positive and put my will in the center and go, okay, I'm feeling massive rage. I'm going to put my will in the center and I'm going to drive that rage into 50 books. Just pass me that, Bab, thank you. So you look at that, that, watch my back. That's my first expression of turning <clears throat> the molten anger into something beautiful. This is a book that's taught, it's this, this people think it's about a bounce, it's really about a frightened kid trying to find his way home, mm. trying to find his way back to the self. So that was my first conversion of negative energy into positive energy, and it's gone all around the world. It's been a stage play, it's been a BAFTA winning film, mm -hmm. it's been uh, thousands of articles, it's been thousands of talks. Uh, there's been three films made about my life, take, just taken from little stories in here. Yeah. Romans 12.20, Romans, who I've just done with Orlando Bloom, was a small story from mm -hmm. this book. It's like a, yeah. that, that was what, that, this is what we call con converting the material 
into the spiritual. We're turning, we're converting the negative into the positive. So I don't want to project this force in an occult way and say it's oh, it's all terrible and it's evil and the devil's trying to chase us. That is true. But actually, if we recognise this force and use it instead of having that anger and that violence and that rage, we go, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this platform. I'm gonna use this gift of energy. I'm gonna control it this key, and I'm going to, instead of putting it through a negative filter, I'm going to put it through a positive filter. Mm -hmm. So some kid in the middle of nowhere, thousands of miles away from here, is going to wake up at three in the morning in a cold sweat, wants to kill himself, he's going to see my interview with you, he's going to see your interview with me, and he's going to go, I can do something with this. This is a neutral energy if I'm able yeah. to convert it. So we can really do something powerful with it. Yeah, you already are, brother. And you, to think that you were scared to write that book because you were worried about how people would treat you, yeah. your wife and everything. And look what it's done. This is the power of speaking out. And I yeah. always say that, speak out, open up. Don't yeah. be ashamed, don't have pride. And to have and to forgive, like they say, revenge is better served when you actually forgive, walk yeah. away and be happy. It's... Um, it's powerful though that because yeah. we've all got ego, we've all got revenge, what we want to hurt, and because we think that will heal us. But you've just put it there clearly, and it's yeah. actually made me feel better to realise: forgive them, yeah. just forgive them. The pain yeah. will dissolve. The, you will break the connection, or the parasite will eat you alive. So when you started going through all that from a very young age, when did you really start getting into martial arts? <clears throat> I started. I mean, the, my first my, the abuse happened with the martial arts teacher, which made it worse. Because then I became frightened of going to martial arts classes because I thought every teacher's going to abuse me. So, but I started to go. I started to train in Shotokan. I just had this urge to build up this armory. It's actually the armory was very good for me in one way because it gave me the courage to sit down and think, well, if I can, if I can stand in front of someone that wants to kill me outside a nightclub, I can sit and write a book. Mm -hmm. I can take a bit of criticism. So it gave me the courage to write and tell my story. But as I started to write and tell the story, my own writing showed me, it's like a blueprint of where I was. It showed me where I was in alignment. It showed me where I was out of alignment. And it helped me to start understanding energy. If there is a language of God, it's energy. So it started to say energy is neutral. Until we conceptualize it, it's not anything. So it's not, there's not evil energy or positive energy. When you go beyond all that, it's just energy. Once we conceptualize it, when we, when we conceptualize it, we give it a concept, it creates a form. Once we give it a form, it has an aspect. So I can say, uh, this person is evil, so that's the form. That if he's evil, it means, it means he'll take the form of evil and his aspect will be to hurt me and other people. So I've created an evil form and an evil aspect out of a concept. But if I'm able to go beyond denotation, if I'm be able to go beyond labels, it's really just an energy. It's a neutral energy. And I can do whatever I want with it. I can, I can set somebody on fire with a, with a can of petrol or I can heat a house. It's the same, it's actually absolutely the same energy. So once we start to get that, we go, wow, that's what I want to do. Like you, I look at you and I think, uh, this guy has massive energy. I feel it. It's radiating from you. Some of it wants to go in the wrong direction. Same as all of us. Yeah, I'm bad one still. Yeah, but that's okay. You've, once mm. you see it, once you go, this is a neutral energy. If I let it come through the filter of, of vengeance, then it's going to go out into the world and it's going to act and it's going to create karma. You know, there'll be consequences and I'll have to, I'll have to do something with that. But mm. if you really want to look at it and go, if I can control this energy and bring it through this this instrument and project it into the world in a good way. It's just going to create a massive kingdom for yeah. you. I want to touch on that when you thought your wife was leaving the room, she, you thought you're being abandoned. I feel like that. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, all my relationships break down because of my trust issues after yeah. maybe two or three months, I'll kind of break it up before I feel as if they'll hurt me. How do I deal with that? I'm going to ask for myself here. How do I deal with the jealousy, the rage, the insecurities yeah. to work on myself. I've worked on so much. These are the things that I want to work on now to give a bit of trust and learn how to trust people. And, yeah. and if they're going to hurt me, then so be it. But I don't let it get that far to get yeah. hurt. Is that abandonment issues? Yeah, it's an abandonment schema. Yeah. And if you look up abandonment schema online, it's very powerful. Psychotic jealousy, the inability to trust, the will is taken over by a, by a false belief. And it, and it creates imagination and then it actually creates form and it damages the very things that we want to hold dear. Yeah. I so remember going on Radio yeah. 2 and them 
they were I was doing an interview on Radio 2 with this anti-self-help guy, and he was just saying the idea of thinking reality into form is ridiculous. The idea of, you know, he kept going on about the secret and the, all of the... He, he kept saying there were um, snake oil salesmen and stuff like this. And, and the interviewer said to me, what's your thoughts? And I said, well, I can only tell you from my experience. He said, I have absolutely created amazing relationships and I've created fortunes with my thinking and I said I can also tell you with the same thinking reversed I've destroyed relationships and I've physically destroyed people with my thinking because my thinking has become words and my words have become actions I said um, so I can absolutely tell you that our thinking does create our reality and it creates according to the filters we've got so what I started to do was recognize that first of all I don't need to trust my wife James I don't need to trust my wife I just really, initially, I need to trust myself. So I started to say, well, do I trust myself? And I was like, no. I'm running to look at pornography every time she's not looking. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going and masturbating when she's not looking. I don't even need to. I've got a great relationship. But I'm doing all that behind her back. I don't, I'm, I don't need to trust her. I need to trust me. Do I trust me? And I absolutely didn't trust me. I didn't even trust my own hands. Then I realized later when I did more um, internal dialectics that... Probably while I'm in a human body, I'm never going to be able to trust the ego. It's always looking for a way to rebel. I'm never going to be able to trust myself. So what can I trust? I can trust God. But I don't, I'm not talking about a man in the sky with kind eyes and a beard. I'm talking about our highest potential. Higher power. A higher power, yeah. So I think if I can connect to that um, still center, the Buddhists call it the still center, if I can connect to that place, to intuition, that's the only thing I can trust. In order to get to that, I need to get rid of all the obscurations, all the clutter. So I need a clear view. And to get a clear view, I need to re remove all the things that aren't clear. The good thing is with you is that you have self-awareness and you're honest. So you can go, these things I'm doing, and I know they're not right, but I don't know how to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I would get rid of them by not engaging them. See, I'm identifying with them more. So that I have, because I used to get angry a lot, what, like... I was the kind of get punching doors and kicking holes in walls. It's yeah. petty, embarrassing stuff. But every time I identified with it, I changed my neural pathways into thinking, because I do affirmations every morning as well. I repeat to myself that yeah. I am good enough. I am strong. Yeah. I am protected. And it makes me feel better. I, I believe it raises my vibration. I believe all the external stuff that I was doing, wanting the materialistic things, the drug abuse, drug abuse, all the sex, all the bullshit, the gambling, um, I was doing all that, but it was poking holes in more, and I felt more, and I felt as if more things were seeping in. Now that I've cut away all the negativity, I'm on a conscious frame of mind. I understand that if I have a bad day, it's down to me, and I can change yeah. it. But these are the now things that I want to is work on within. Trust myself because I don't trust anybody. I'm going to be honest, Jeff. I still struggle with yeah. trust issues, but I really am working on it. I'm, I, this is something that I listen. We'll be working on myself through the day we die. I just want yeah. to improve myself so people can look and take inspiration and go, if he can do it, I can do it. I'm still learning. Yeah. So I'm not necessarily what I'm saying or doing is right, but it feels right for me, including yourself. People will watch and go, that's amazing. Other people will take negatives. That's what people do. We just You can read a page on something and take negatives or positives. And same as myself, I've, I just think sometimes that's the cards you're dealt. All the shit that you went through from such a very young age yeah. is now made into this beautiful human being who can now help change others' lives. You wouldn't be able to speak in prisons if you never went through no. all the no. pain and trauma. If I never went through all my addictions, I wouldn't be able to be speaking, yeah. helping people with suicide or doing the homeless work that we do. It's just, yeah. again, to do the other stuff in life and try to help others, I feel sometimes I'm doing that because it's rewarding for me. So I question that also. Why am I doing the suicide stuff? Why am I doing the homeless stuff? Because I know it feels right for me. I don't want the approval, but I feel good. Yeah. Try to help somebody else. Well, that's because good. you know yeah. yourself, the money, the attention, it is all bullshit. It's, it's all outside noise. Yeah. It's just try to keep working on yourself. But do you feel as if though we can constantly search, Jeff, and forget to live as well? We just want but to it, always know answers. But it's not it isn't really about searching. Mm -hmm. It's just about it's just about recognizing what is not you and then no longer engage in it. So reality exists at the level of engagement. Mm. So if we identify with a feeling, a thought, if we engage it, if it rises up in us and we engage it, and then we think it and speak it and then act it, then it's, then it's um, possessed us. So for that moment in time when we engage that thought, 
we are um, incarnated into that personality. So if I engage negativity, if I engage anger, um, and I act on it, then I am, in that moment in time, I am incarnated into that, into that personality. So I'm incarnated into an angry personality. The angry personality acts in the world, creates karma, and then when it recedes, because it's had its feed, then the normal James has got to come forward and he's got to pick up the bills. Like the, the, the respectable Dr. Hyde is already, always picking up the bills for the disrespectful, disrespectful Mr. Jekyll. Uh, the, 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 I think it's Dr. Jekyll is always picking up the bills for Mr. Hyde. So it's his, same, it's his alter personality. So we've got to recognize that if you don't engage it, it doesn't exist. So we have to learn not to engage it. We have to learn to recognize when thoughts and emotions approach or when they rise in us and if we don't give them engagement if we don't identify with them they have no existence so if they've got existence it's because we've given them so the first thing is to see them go well, they're not i don't i'm not going to engage those feelings because that's just a waste of energy. beautiful energy mm -hmm. um, and like i said the language of god is energy so i'm not going to waste that so the practice then becomes observing, finding the observer, finding the witness and watching the energies. So you sit in the center of the arc here and you watch the energies rise, you watch them lift, you watch them approach and watch what they do if you don't engage them, watch how they just dissipate again. Dissolve. So we think the thoughts are ours. You think they're your thoughts, but they're not your thoughts. They may have a partner in you. They may have an old script or an old wound or, not, or something there, but thought is a separate realm. It is another realm, so it's like gravity, it's a separate thing. And what we do is, we don't recognise that, so we go, I felt this, I thought this, you know, and we don't recognise that they're not our thoughts. So we can, we, once we recognise that the thoughts come from outside of us, we can start to monitor ourselves and go, I'm going to watch that. Do I want to engage that thought? Do I want to identify with that thought? Is there something in me that identifies with it? Then if there is, I'm going to, I'm going to stop feeding it. Um, and if you don't engage it, you get stronger at this, holding this uh, observer center, and you don't engage it. So eventually, you only engage the thoughts that are going to be beneficial to you and other people. Mm -hmm. And of course, you will feel good about it, because um, I'm just a vessel. I don't, I don't have love in me. I don't have energy in me. I'm just a vessel for it. So if I want love, I just need to find someone who needs it more than me. Then I can be a receptacle for it. Then it can, it can coat and sate every one of my trillions of cells before I process it and give it to you. Because mm. the anger can take over. Is it cortisol? What's the, uh, the adrenaline that releases the brain? Yeah. I think it's, if you think about the pain of the past, it can release the chemicals yeah. to the emotions that you'd felt that day. The brain's such a powerful tool. It's, yeah. it's amazing. But when you started getting into the, the bouncing and stuff, what age were you then? I was in my early 20s. I'd had a, I'd had a, a breakdown probably you know, 22, 23, I'd had lots of depressions caused by this as a displacement to what happened to me when I was a kid. Also, I had this creative urge and wasn't finding an outlet for it. So I had this kind of terrible depression and somewhere in the middle of this depression where depression used to come into my life and just take over, it just used to wipe me out. It used to just feed off me and everybody around me. And then this one particular time, I just found this, I just found this rage, this, this I think I connected with my soul and I just said, I'm not having this anymore. That's the last time you're going to do this. That's the last time you're going to come into my life and kick down my door and take over my life and take over my wife and my kids and, and you know, kind of end my existence for, for as long as you want to end it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not having it anymore. So I just had this idea to write down everything I was afraid of, everything. I drew a pyramid on a piece of paper. I wrote my least fear on the bottom step, my worst fear on the top step, and I systematically started to confront my fears. I started to embrace them, intercourse with them, until they dissipated, mm. and until I got to the top of the pyramid. And the top of the pyramid was a fear of violent confrontation. So I became a doorman to overcome that fear. And that was the story of Watch My Back, of why I wrote Watch My Back, um, and what happened on the door, how I went on there for salvation to overcome a fear, but I also I became violent myself. I got addicted to it. I got addicted to the life. It was like um, Sodom and Gomorrah and Pompeii all mm. mixed into one. It was delicious. It was seedy. It was colourful. It was um, exotic. It was violent. It was 
you know, if you if you wanted to draw, if you wanted to draw, you know, the end at Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what it was like. It was, you know, it was intoxicating but frightening at the same time. And I knew, I was absolutely knew I was at my depth. I was no fighter. I got a second down in karate, but I got no control of my endocrine system. I got no control of my adrenaline. And I just decided after one night that I'm not going to do this anymore. It's too much. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take it off my list and, and just move on. But at the end of the night, I was working with a guy called John Anderson, who was this, um, I think I was quietly in love with him because he was just this, you know, he was so, such a powerful guy. He spoke twice a year, you know, um, or smiled twice a year and spoke <laughs> like he was being charged by the letter. He was just this cool black guy who was benching four plates, squatting five plates, and could punch like a professional boxer. Um, and he was monosyllabic, hardly ever spoke, but he was just this fierce presence. And he took a liking to me. He said, you're clumsy, you're a greenhorn, but you stayed. He said, so if you want to carry on and do a bit more, do a bit more. And he took me under his wing and he quietly taught me. He taught me to find the center. He taught me to, he taught me to build a, a, an eye wall so I could sit in the middle of chaos. I could sit in the middle of you know, life-threatening fear and control myself. I could stay there. But again, like I said, I became too violent myself. I started to batter people. I started to humanize people. I didn't really understand karma. I thought I was doing a good job. I didn't realize that every person I hit was, you know, was something I'd have to pay for later on. So once I started to realize that, and I started to realize it because I wrote about it, um, I started to work on reversing it. I started thinking, I don't, I don't want to leave people with a black eye or a broken jaw. I want to leave people inspired. I want to leave people thinking, this is, you know, this, this guy's convinced me I can change the world. But to do that, I've got to be, you know, it's no good me telling them they can change the world if I can't change my socks once a day, you know. Mm -hmm. It's no good me telling them, you know, that they, they have the power to change reality if I, can't, if I can't resist a second beer or if I can't resist a second pudding or I can't stop myself from gossiping about somebody and assassinating their character over a coffee at Costa. I've got to have control. I've got to understand karma. I've got to understand that when I speak... Uh, in, Jap in Japanese, Aikido, they would call this Kotodama Gaku, the use of magic sound. So when I speak, I am releasing energies. spirits and energies into the world yeah. that are going to go out and work. Mm -hmm. Am I releasing good energies or am I releasing negative energies? So I started to understand that and started to think, I don't want to do anything that doesn't come from kindness. To, do, to, to, be, able to, do, to, to be able to do that, you've got to find out who you are. And at the moment, we were talking earlier on about you know, you're talking about who you are and who you're not. When you're talking about the anger and the, la the, the inability to trust, those are parts of you that aren't you. So that's good. So you look at that and go, it's not you that I can't trust, but there is an element in you or an, ele an elemental in you or a parasite in you that I can't trust. You've got to observe that. You've got to bring it forward. And when it rises up and goes, I can't trust, you've just got to go, I'm not having that. It's not, a, it's not a good use of my energy. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm either going to get boot that out like a squatter or I'm going to convert it into something beautiful. Yeah, because it can ruin your days. It can ruin days, weeks, months, years. A guy like, a guy like you, you're in a dangerous mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. A guy like me is in a dangerous position because we're going to go out there. We want to tell people they can change the world yeah. because they can. So these energies, that, these energies that are pervading, these roaming lines of negativity, they are going to make their way to you and they're going to find, that they're going to find a way into you through any crack. And that's why they're good for you. Yeah. They, 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 if, you don't, if you don't heed them and they come through the crack, they can kill you, they can destroy you. We've seen that. Mm. We've seen what happens to people when they allow negativity in. So these energies need to be, these energies are saying to you, James, you've got a leak here. This anger, this lack of trust, that's just a leak. And I'm going to climb in and I'm going to be all over you. I'm going to destroy relationships. And I'm going, to, I mean, I'm going to discredit you. And I'm going to kill the platform that you've got. I'm going to kill it because you won't be able to handle the energy that's coming through you. Mm -hmm. So you've got to recognize that these are a blessing. They're God's master swordsmen. They've come to show you how to use your energy. So we go, okay, I'm feeling mistrust. Is that who I am? No. So don't engage it. If, I got, if, a, if someone knocks the door and his name is mistrust and his, mate, his name is uh, uh, psychotic jealousy, you're not going to let him in and sit, in, sit down, are you? You're not going to let him into this beautiful place and sit down and take advantage of everything. But that's what we do when we engage these negative feelings. Mm -hmm. So we have to 
look at that we have to look at it and go when that rises up in, in now I'm just not going to engage it whether you find the root of it is is neither here nor there it's just really about not engaging just it. not acting on the thought but not feeding it either mm -hmm. are you feeding it these things feed off excessive food they feed off excessive drink they feed off of other people's charms of other people's valid uh, validation they feed off any any form of pornography sexual pornography violent pornography you know they feed off any of these negativities so it's never really about what people are eating it's about what people are feeding what mm. are we feeding yeah so when you stop feeding these parasites eventually they'll just go oh, i ain't gonna hang around here this guy's not giving us anything and we think that we don't live and that we think that we don't enjoy then because we're not having those things but actually we're not living and enjoying when we do have them because we're not ourselves. Yeah, volume percent. Yeah, so we yeah. we we may, maybe we're two or three or ten different personalities. Mm -hmm. So the idea is recognizing that reality exists at the level of engagement. If it rises up in you, do you want this to be your reality? Mm -hmm. When you speak, you release spirit, you release energy, and that goes out into the world and works, and it brings you back the profits. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot of stuff about. When you're speaking, like people gossiping, it's like black magic. Yeah. You're putting it out there if people are, because people are always complaining about their job, their relationships. Yeah. And that's not the people you should be hanging around with. No. That is black magic. You're putting that into existence. Yeah. And if you're surrounded by it, it will seep into your pores as well. Yeah. It's, it's still nuts that I don't know why I've come into all this stuff, the stuff that I'm reading, the stuff that I'm learning, the stuff about myself. It's a beautiful thing, but it, like you say, it is scary to put yourself yeah. and be so vulnerable because we all care what others think. And once you break that chain that we don't actually care anymore, it, it takes so you when, to different levels. So when that rises up and it yeah. says, this part of me cares what people think, you go, is that me? The soul doesn't give a fuck. The soul in the center is not, not affected by that. It's impervious to all that. It's, you're in the very, very center of the still center. None of those things exist. So if it rises up and I care and I need validation and I, and I allow myself to engage that, then I've created a bond between me and the, the need for validation and that's going to feed off me and that's going to affect my work, especially if you're relying on it you know, if you're relying on things for sponsorship and, mm -hmm. you know, and you're relying on because you want to win an award or you, or you want, you know, someone to acknowledge you, all those things feed the parasite. So what we do is we go, all I want to do is bring down energy. This is what started Watch My Back. I was so angry that people weren't telling the truth and they weren't being vulnerable. And it wasn't, I was so depressed, I was reading everything and nobody was telling the truth. And I just I remember thinking, when I find the truth, I'm going to tell everybody. And I didn't realize, but that is the secret to the tree of life. That's the secret to abundance. There's a lovely saying in, in the Zohar, the king sets the table for the servant before he eats himself. In other words, we find somebody that's more needy and more vulnerable than us. And we go, I want to bring this information down, this money down, you know, this wealth down so that I can serve the kid who's sleeping in a doorway or so that I can serve the people out there who are lost and trying to find themselves. So when we draw down in order to serve others, mm -hmm. well, there will be abundance. But this energy will just go, well, this is a rich energy. You're a 100 watt bulb. You want to take in a thousand watts. We need to change the infrastructure. We need to master the infrastructure. We're not going to bring a thousand watts into a 100 watt bulb. It'll just, there'll be a glow of light and it'll pop. It's not sustainable. Yeah. So we go, we prepare the infrastructure. And that's about completely immersing your life into this service but as you said earlier on which is very insightful all service is self-service Charles Handy calls it proper selfishness when we are when we do things that are good for other people it serves us of course mm -hmm. it does so what I do I don't think about serving you I don't think about serving the kid in the street I think about serving God because he's omniscient he's omnipotent he's omnipresent so he's my highest potential so if I'm saying to this being, show me how to serve you, it means I'm serving me, it means I'm serving you, it means I'm serving everybody. If I say, if I say um, um, show me how to serve James, then it will just show me how to serve one person. But if I say, show me how to serve you, it will show me how to serve, it will, it will give me um, the overview of everything. Mm -hmm. So I follow that divine satnav. I listen to intuition. I develop acoustic clarity. And I really sharpen my vision so that I'm hearing and I'm seeing true. Do you look for signs and stuff, like maybe numbers and stuff like that? Is that do you look for that kind of stuff? I don't look for it, nah. but it does come. Yeah. All that stuff comes. All of it. All of it's 
kind of you know it's indicators kind but, of guidance and yeah the guidance. i know people might say like butterflies you might say uh, like maybe say the numbers two 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 the fit. people can say that as signs from whatever as a higher being or yeah a higher power to guide you that there is meaning behind everything. There's meaning mm. behind every action. There's meaning yeah. behind every reaction. Every single thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's meaning behind everything. How long were you a bouncer for, Jeff? Um, probably, uh, probably, um, I think it was about eight years, something like that. I know I worked at one point. I was working six nights a week, and I was working everywhere. I mean, I was, I was in it. I was in it up to my nuts. It was all I did. Is that because you enjoyed the fighting? Was I that your it. escape? I loved the. I just loved the world. I suddenly I'd gone from this depressive kid who was frightened of a spider in the bath to standing and, and guarding a door, you know, with some some of the biggest villains in the city. So I was I was, you know, I just there was this sense of it was a false power, power. but yeah. there was a sense of power. And and it was good. It was bad in that it was it was only it was only kind of physical and psychological, but it was good in the fact that, you know, until we fill the physical and the psychological and the physiological and, the, and we're not going to spill into the metaphysical. So doing, you know, properly, properly doing the doors and properly learning what works and what doesn't work and understanding how to deal with not people, but energies. Mm -hmm. You know, you deal, you, you're learning to deal with the most volatile, seductive energies. And to, to be able to control their energies, you've got to be able to control your energy. Now, although I said I went a bit corrupt with that, which I did, I did learn to control energies. I learned to manage energies. I learned to manage my own energy. But that took me to a level where I thought, I need more, I want more. You know, because I recognise, I'm suddenly on the door thinking, uh, I said to my wife once, you know, everywhere I go in Coventry, there's violence. It's a violent city. And she said, it's, there's a common denominator, Jeff. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere you go. And I recognise that my beliefs, my cognitions, my perceptions... Uh, I, I recognised they were all set um, off. They were all slightly off. So you I were thought... attracting it? I, w I was actually creating it. Yeah. Because everybody who it. I hang around with, I used to say, everybody takes drugs, everybody gambles. They didn't. No. It's just because <laughs> I hung around with those people, though, because it didn't make me feel as much of a loser. Yeah, because yeah. Because then it felt normal. But yeah. we actually step out this very small box that you're in. You yeah. realise... Wait a minute, we don't all do that. Nah. I just done it and I hung about with the exact same people on the exact same vibration that just met me yeah. at that time. We all made each other feel better. We were all lost, we were all losers. Yeah. And I don't mean that to put anybody no, down, but I just yeah. feel as if we were just lost and you were getting that power where you thought, it's a fake power, yeah. you thought you were the man. You, But it's funny because I interview the biggest, well, gang, what is a gangster? It's a weak man who tells other weak men what to do. In my opinion, you ain't a bad man because... No. But when you break it all down, you're the one is the baddest man in the UK, yeah. if not the world. But yeah. you were breaking inside. Yeah. You were vulnerable. Yeah. You were weak. You were scared. Yeah. And Very weak, all that yeah. stuff as a mask. So I never glorify gangsters. People might say, oh, the name gangster. But I don't glorify anyone. I try and get people to understand. Yeah. These people were broken. They yeah. were hurt. They were damaged. Yeah. And look what they're trying to achieve to create And behind a that life. is a soul. Yeah. I, I met with uh, Mad Frankie Fraser, with Dave mm -hmm. Courtney. Uh, Reggie Cray used to ring me all the time, he used to write to me. Um, and I never judged them because I was very violent. Um, and I remember being in a room with Mad Frankie Fraser. I was on a radio show. There was him, there was Ronnie Biggs, he was on the phone. There was a, a New York policewoman who, was, who turned into a, a, a porno, pornography star. And it was on the Ter uh, Terry Christian show. And I remember, well, first of all, I remember thinking, fucking hell, I'm surrounded. I, I, know, I know what's inside me because yeah. it's surrounding me. Mm -hmm. But I remember talking to Mad Frankie Frazier and seeing God through him. That's what I remember. I remember this energy. He was charming. Obviously, he was volatile and he'd done a lot of bad things, but he was charming. Um, and when I spoke to him, I remember him being a very small physical man, but he filled the room. I mean, he filled the room with his menace, with his presence. I remember thinking... I remember seeing the signature there, thinking there's a signature beyond this. This is a powerful energy, but it's coming through negative is filters. Fear? He, yeah, he's got, you know, he's got beliefs and fears. Mm -hmm. So there are his filters, and this powerful energy is coming through them and creating negatively. But I remember thinking, if this guy could align himself to goodness, to service, he'd fill stadiums, because he had an access to something. And I, wanted, I didn't want to judge him, I just wanted to understand it. Same as when Reggie Cray used to ring me up. I could feel the menace through the phone. 
I could feel it vibrating through the phone. I could feel it permeating my life. And I wanted to know the, I wanted to know what the origin of that signature was, because I knew beyond that, I knew that it was a negative, I knew that it was a negative representation, but I knew that it had a a pure signature. So it's like, um, you know, like like water coming through a pipe. If it, you know, if if it, comes to a dirty pipe, it's going to come out the other end dirty, even if it started clean. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, I want to find the source of this. I want to be able to access the energy they've got, but I want to be able to be in a room. I want my proximity to that energy to be so close that people are healed or people are uh, transported or people are inspired just because I'm in the room, even if they don't know who I am. And that's about proximity. That's about getting as close to the clean water as possible. These people had it. It just come through a negative filter. I had it, and it was coming through violent filters because I had the wrong beliefs. Mm-hmm. So once I was able to strip those back, this is what the Buddha said, I'm freed from denotation by consciousness. In other words, I don't see labels. There are no labels. There is no good, there's no bad. You know, there's no high, there's no low. There's no upside down. There's no right way up. There is just energy. And then I'm the vessel that it comes through in order to create in the world. If it's going to come through negative filters, it's going to create in a negative way. So denotation means that we put a label on something. I put a label on this microphone. I put a label on this glass of water. I might put a label on you or that camera. But actually, it's all made up of exactly the same molecules. Yeah. We label it, but if we, if we stop labeling everything, it stops becoming anything. As human beings, we have became very judgmental, though. Yeah. How, I'm including myself, Jeff. How do, I, how do I work on that to be in... No, Stop judging people. Who, oh, who just, am I to judge? Is that a reflection yeah. of me seeing yeah. my, my yeah. insecurities in them? How do yeah. I, 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 when I say this, I do identify it. I know I'm going to kick on. I know I'm going to change the world. I'm going to make, it might sound egotistic, whatever, but I'm going to make the best documentaries and yeah. I want to be the biggest podcast in the world. Even that, I question that because what really the fuck does that mean yeah. as well? Yeah. I just want to work on all these things because I know it'll just shoot us into the stratosphere. My energy yeah. will rise, my vibration will rise, and then I'll be not unstoppable, but I just know if I work on and tweak all these wee things that it's just going to take us into another level. How do you work on like the judgmental stuff? And well, What you're looking at is the part of the, all the stuff you want is what you already are. That's mm-hmm. the point. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you already are unstoppable. You are, mm-hmm. already are touching the whole universe. So the, what you're looking for is very worthy, but you, you already are it. So my, my advice to you, if you're asking me, is to remove all the things that aren't that. Judgment is not that. Mm-hmm. Judgment is just, if you, good thing with judgment is just add, add a couple of words to the end of it. So if you say a person is greedy, just add at the end of it, uh, just like me. That person is greedy, just like me. That person is a C, just like me. That mm-hmm. person is horrible, just like me. The moment, and if you don't understand basic psychology, you recognize that. You know, what we don't like in other people is what we don't like in ourselves. So if the person we're judging, uh, you know, is greedy or, or whatever he is, he represents something in us that we don't like. So he's a teacher. Give him a check, take him for a coffee, thank him. Even if you hate the guy, he's your teacher because he's showing you a projection of what's in you. That means you can go home, forget about him. Mm. He's a distraction. Just work on that part he's shown you. Just work on that. Because that's true. These people, everybody will become your teacher. Mm -hmm. Everything will become your teacher. The beams in your house, um, you know, and the wood on your floor will be your teacher. Everything will reflect back to you where you are. So when you became eighth Dan and got all the black belts, I question myself for trying to be the the best podcast. I believe we need purpose. I believe we need drive. I've found my lane. I love what I do, which is the most important thing. How do you find the balance though to go and, what does it, because I question it, what does it mean to be number one? What does it mean to have, be an eighth Dan? What does it actually mean? Well, if we mean? come back to the centre again, mm-hmm. um, what I said before, you, you already are that in the centre. So what you're looking for is in you. Mm-hmm. So if you really want to do all that, you need to, you need to contract. In order to expand, you need to contract. You see what I'm saying? So you need to contract anything egoic, anything that, you know, you need validation for, anything you need praise for. The part of you that you're looking for is all of those things. So I've already got it. You've already got it, mm-hmm. but it is obscured. Yeah. So you can look at what, 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 have you, what you have to ask yourself is what in me is obscuring that? So mm. if you take your clothes off and look in the mirror, you know, um, we, want, we want to tell people, 
we can change the world. I wanted to tell people they could change the world. I couldn't even change my own waist size. Yeah. I was overweight. Mm -hmm. I was carrying about four stone too much weight. I couldn't, but I, I was saying I was going to change the world, but I couldn't resist a third cake. I couldn't resist another beer. I was saying I, I was going to change the world, and I was saying we're powerful beings, but I was still watching sexual pornography and allowing parasites across the threshold. Yeah. So if you really want to be all those things, it's just a matter of going away and going, well, uh, you're talking about gossip, you're talking about moments mm -hmm. of uh, feeling violence, yeah. just start working on them. So it's just understanding you're already those things, yeah. the validation. is So it's basically, a, I'm looking for the validation. It's just to understand that you're already those things. You don't really need the validation. You already need them, yeah. Yeah, perfect. I'm asking a lot of questions about myself, mate, because I, no, it's I, all right, I, yeah. I, I feel as if we're going to be connected for as long as we're on this planet. I don't know why. I just feel that connection that you can help me a long way. No doubt we can help each other, yeah, but yeah. I feel as if that you've got a lot of inspiration. You know a lot of stuff. I'm at the start of my journey. Yeah. You're clearly going through yours. You've done a lot of changes and everything that you're doing you've got is the courage because you're talking about it you're recognizing it you're owning it um and not what i'm saying is in order to expand you need to contract mm -hmm. and in order to contract you need to expand so we need to contract the ego i, I remember talking to yuri geller on the phone once and i said to him yuri how can i improve this is many years ago and he said to me jeff you need to expand and then i did a an, uh, um, a dedicated meditation with mahatma gandhi and I said to Mahatma Gandhi, how can I improve? He said, you need to make yourself small. So both of them were saying the same things. So we need to contract the ego in order to expand consciousness. And we need to expand consciousness in order to contract the ego. So if you meditate and start doing you know, your, your aphorisms and your prayer and all that kind of thing, especially meditation, that expands conscious awareness. As you expand conscious awareness, the ego automatically contracts. It's, they, they don't sit well together. If you start to contract the ego by doing the work, you know, by getting your palate right, and when I say palate, what you eat, what you drink, you know, what you take in through the eyes, what you hear, you know, anything you ingest, when you, when you start to control the palate and start to control the ego and subjugate the ego, you will automatically make more room for consciousness. Mm -hmm. So God's saying to you and to me, you can have as much of me as you want. You can have as much consciousness as you want you just have to make room yeah and while you know we whilst we whilst we can't uh change our own physical body you know to a healthy place yeah we can't stand in front of mm -hmm. people this is what zig ziglar said he said he was telling people they could change the world and one of them said do you really believe this and he said yeah absolutely he said so why are you four stone overweight and he goes good point mm -hmm. so he said i went off and lost the four stone, and then I would say to people, you can change the world, but don't look at me too closely. Listen to everything I'm saying. Don't look at me too closely, because I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. He was aware that we, we, have, to, we have to be a living example of what we say. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to be a living example of what we want to do. So if, we wanna, if you want to really improve this podcast and make it global, then, uh, then start contracting. Start, start keep working on myself working and on show. People yeah. can see, can't they? They can see if you're in a good place or not. Yeah. And no matter if you think you've got vision or you can see yeah. orders or energies, you can notice that. Well, they say okay, that a good one, place. one good dog will make seven dogs piss. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's an old Japanese yeah. saying. You know what I mean? One good, one good person, one aligned person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People will automatically align. We want to excite them um, and say to them, "You really want to be powerful." If you really want to be cat powerful, be kind every day. You want an esoteric exercise, be kind. We can't even be kind to the reflection in the mirror. Yeah. Be kind. So be kind love. to people, yeah. To put it every time you sit down with your friends and you feel it coming on, just take your phone out, put it on tape record. Um, and if you want to start gossiping about people, let's give it, if we're going to gossip about John, let's give it to John afterwards and see what he thinks about it. Mm -hmm. We'd be very quiet, wouldn't yeah, we? Yeah, you'd be embarrassed. Yeah, yeah so it's just, uh, yeah. it's recognising that it's, mm -hmm. this energy is essential, it's pure, it's beautiful. So we don't want to waste it on stuff like that. But also, we don't want to put literal beings into the world with our sound and create negative things. Yeah, when you were, when you were a bouncer, there was two events, one you were nearly killed, and then two, you nearly killed someone. Yeah. What were those events that happened? I had a lot of, you know, I had a lot of moments of terror, and then and then followed by moments of clarity. You know, I'd have the 4, 4 a.m. phone call, we're going to kill your wife, we're going to shoot your children. You know, I'd have 
you know, we're always getting death threats, always people going to do that. And people turning up, you know, with guns and, um, you know, four of my friends were murdered during the time I was a bouncer. So it was, it was a very real threat. So you manage that. Um, but I, I had one occasion where I was working and I was just kind of, um, you know, I mean, bearing in mind Coventry was a rough city. You could, you could start a fight in an empty room, you know. It was uh, just... a I was just doing a night in this particular place and it was it was really ran by this particular gang um, and I was just kind of covering for somebody and when it kicked off the the, the, the doormen were in the pocket of this gang because they were a notorious gang a very dangerous gang and they were in the pocket of this gang and when it kicked off I realised I was you know it was like a proper bar fight proper John Wayne fight I got glassed and um, I was knocking a lot of people out and I, you know I was just was the only thing I did right, really, was I stayed on my feet. I didn't go down, and that's why I didn't die. But I got battered, but I just stayed up. And the guy that, um, the guy that instigated the whole thing, I went outside and followed him outside and said, listen, you know, you're full of noise in there, and you've got all your friends in there. He's with two or three people. I went outside. The doorman locked me out. So the doorman disappeared when it kicked off, and when I went outside, they locked me out. So I was on my own, and I just said, let's just go around the corner and do a one-on-one, -on -one, just me and you. And this is a technique I used to use. It's from, uh, uh, from Sun Tzu. It's, you know, Sun Tzu, the art of war. Separate your enemy from his allies. So I said, listen, lads, I've got no argument with you. This is just about me and him. And they went. So I said, just me and you. So I took all his allies away. And he goes, it's not safe. And I said, what do you mean it's not safe? I said, my, my friends have locked me outside. I'm on my own. It's just me and you. Anyway, you bottled it. But that night really made me think, because I felt you do feel your mortality. You do think, how I didn't die, I don't know. It was only, I think, the training in Shotokan, which was a very, very tough Japanese art. Although, you know, although I got battered, I didn't go down, I stayed up, and that's what kept me alive. But I went away and I said to my class, listen, I got battered last night. I said, only my spirit, my will, kept me on my feet. And it really made me think about a lot of things. Um, so I had a lot of incidents like that where I, where I really felt something extra. But then there was this one particular night where I'd, um, I'd had a fight with this guy um, in, a, in, a, in a place I used to work called the Devon. And he was another cratty guy, as it turned out. And he was just a customer. And then I was desperately trying to transcend the physical. I was trying to become less physical. I was trying to talk to people. I was trying to articulate. And this guy, for whatever reason, took a dislike to me. And he just kept looking at me. When I was collecting glasses at the end of the night, as I went to, to the bar, he would just step him away and bump me. And I was just thinking, he had no idea. He had no idea what I was doing and where I was and what I could do. He just obviously saw a balding, kind of articulate guy and just thought, I don't care who he is, you know, I don't like him. So I said to my friend, what's, what's wrong with him? He said, I don't know, he just doesn't like you. I said, does he want to talk to me? you know, in inverted commas. And he goes, yeah, I think he wants to talk to you. So I went over and I said to him, do you want to talk to me? I said, you keep bumping into me. I said, do you want to talk? Do you want to go outside and talk? He says, yeah, I fancy that. So I said, okay, let's go outside. But I was schooled in this stuff. You know, most people are, are amateurs. It's just what they do now and again or what they fancy. I was schooled in this. This is all I did. I lived and breathed it. So it was a, it was a demolition job very quickly. But, I, but I'd held in so much rage because I was trying to change that I just destroyed him. And when he was unconscious, someone picked him up to try and carry him to the car, and I hoofed him as hard as I could in the head. I couldn't stop myself. I was gone. I was gone. He was like every enemy I'd ever met in the world. And as soon as I kicked him, I mean, if you imagine his face is here, someone's holding him up like that, and I'm in front of him, and I backheeled him as hard as I could in the face and knocked him back out again. And then I heard people saying, he's dead, he's dead. They couldn't get him round. They dragged him to the car. They'd toes of his shoes were scratching on the floor and I just remember feeling even my friend Seymour who was with me is this guy's a veteran you know he's one of the most experienced guys you could ever meet even even he looked worried even he said oh, I don't know what you've done he was like this you know and I remember thinking that's it it's over it's gone I'm gonna lose my liberty I'm gonna uh I've still got this background of faith and I'm thinking I'm going to lose my place in the hereafter. I knew, I, I knew something had ended. I knew this guy was going to die and I was never going to be able to recover. And I remember driving home 
and I've told this story before, before but I was driving through the, the midnight streets of Coventry and it was like the veil had dropped. It was like everything was sparkling. You know, like suddenly you don't realise what you've got till somebody takes it away, but it was other dimensional. The streets were sparkling. The lights were sparkling. I'd got this sickness in me. I felt this sickness because I was thinking I'm losing all this. For, for what? For, for just for this, you know, I shouldn't even be on the door. I shouldn't even be in that environment. I shouldn't be there. I went home, my wife was asleep. And I remember, uh, I remember just leaning into her and putting my arms around her and fucking hell, the heat was radiating off her. And she was glowing like a being, you know what I mean? She was like, it was, I can't even explain it, but it was spiritual. I just thought, fucking hell, she's a, she is so beautiful and I've lost her. I went into the other room and my kids were asleep and I knelt down by my kids. Oh, I couldn't believe how much I loved these kids. They were so beautiful and I'm gone. You, you know yourself, if I go into prison, they're not going to be the same kids when I come out. Mm -hmm. My wife isn't going to be the same person. There will be changes. I will know, if I lose this girl this night, if I lose these kids this night, they are not, they are not going to be the same. I've had a lot of people, friends, who are in prison now doing life and double life, and I've had lots of friends go to prison, and when they come out, everything's changed. The people they've left behind aren't the same people. That connection, that love isn't there. Something has been damaged. That won't be repaired. It goes into something else. And I knew that. And I was just so afraid. I was so terrified. And I got down on my knees and I said to God, look, you know, please let this guy live. Please let him live. If you let him live, I promise you, I promise you I will turn this around. I saw it. I just had a, they call it a moment of clarity. I had a glimpse. Now, some moments of clarity lift you and you're floating. You're in a honeymoon period and some moments of clarity destroy you. It's like fire going through you. And I was sick for 24 hours. Any mention of violence on the news was like, it, it was like all my ego had collapsed and it was like my soul was like a child and it was on full display and it was tortured by anything to do with violence, anything to do with anger and hate. And I could see, I could suddenly see that even well-intentioned violence rebounded on itself. So for 24 hours it was, you know, I was lying in bed all night awake and every time I heard, I felt like I'd heard the crack of a policeman's boot on my doorstep, I thought, if he's dead, they're gonna come and get me in the night. They know who I am, I'm known in the city. Everybody, you know, there was, I was, you know, 50 witnesses. And it wasn't like I would have any chance. I'd have no chance at all. I didn't just knock him out. I waited for him to come round and knocked him out again. Yes, it's not self-defense. Nothing. It's mm -hmm. just savage. I would have, they would have thrown away Mata. the key. I would have yeah. got, it would have been a, an 18 with intent. Well, it would have been murder. It would have been murder. And uh, the intent would have been seen because of what I did. And it would have been a life. Because you were like, a karate expert as well would have killed me. Yeah. as well yeah it would have made, it would have made it even worse anyway he didn't die and that's it i started to turn it around but it was i didn't recognize it at the time as a moment of clarity i just recognized that you know god comes to me in different ways sometimes I've, I've i had a when i got invited to teach in a, in a las vegas for chuck norris i remember coming back from there and i was floating for two years i had a proper kundalini um, epiphany where i was impervious nothing affected me i was i just felt love i felt love in my fingertips i felt like anything i touched could be changed but sometimes it, it comes through and it cleans stuff and this particular one when it came through it rushed through it picked up every defilement all these things we're talking about anger jealousy it picked them all up and they were like entities with their own voices and it was like um someone had opened the cells to, to you know, open 20 cells at once and all of these monsters come rushing out and I was, uh, I was on fire. And then the next day, this, like I said, this guy lived and I started to turn it around. I retired from the door. Um, How old I, were you? I was uh, 32. Still young. It's, 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 it's kind of yeah. weird. Like, a lot of people I speak to kind of... They kind of make the changes between 28 and 35 yeah. in their life. It's so weird. And a lot of people I come on here who've got life in prison or who are addicts go on their knees at one point and say, please forgive me yeah. or please give me another chance and I will totally change my life. It's yeah. whether they speak to God. I've, there's, there's, I think there's over 5,000 different gods that yeah. people can say, but there is a higher power. There is someone out there guiding you. And 
it's scary to think that the amount of people that's been on this show and says, please give me guidance or show me, and they've totally transformed their life. And then, you, yeah. Yeah, then you start to see real power. Mm-hmm. You start to see yourself as a vessel for power. You start to see yourself as an instrument of power. So mm-hmm. you don't recognise it as yours. I don't recognise those books as mine. You know, they're forgeries, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, I don't recognise them as mine. I recognise them as something that come mm-hmm. through me. They pick up my stories. They pick up my flavours. Notes from a factory floor, which we've just released now, um, and a book called The Divine Sea. Oh, I couldn't write mm-hmm. that good. It's, they're beautiful, but I couldn't write yeah. that good. I sat down, I sat down with those books, 300,000 words, and they came out in 16 weeks, and I sat down full time. If I had more stamina, I could have written them without stopping. They just came through me, um, and they formed themselves. Even when I did the editing, I I didn't have to think about it at all. Mm -hmm. So although it picks up on my flavors and it picks up on my stories, I know they're not me. Yeah. That's why I can be objective. Mm -hmm. This film we've just done with Orlando Bloom about the metaphysical power of forgiveness. I can tell you it's a beautiful film. I can tell you it's Oscar worthy because it's not mine. You know, I don't, you know, I'm like a postman that's delivered it, mm-hmm. but it's, it hasn't come from me, yeah. but it's come from somewhere that I can access. Mm-hmm. So my job is to try and make myself um, available so that I can access that more often. Yeah. What was it like then when you were a bouncer and teaching to kids? Were you using being a bouncer as an excuse to have violence because it was self-defense, but then going and teach kids because there's all that stuff not about like self-control, self-worth, were you feeling like a fraud as well? Yeah, doing that? I felt like a hypocrite because I was... You don't bump into it until you start to write about it, and when mm. you write about it, it's like a reflection. You're looking at it going, this is a reflection of... You know, you start to see yourself in the true light, and you start to yeah. recognise... You're starting to do interviews... I was starting to do interviews on Sky and on daytime TV and on radio too. And, and I was recognising, I was talking to intellectuals and, and I couldn't rationalise the violence. I could talk, but I couldn't justify what I was doing. And I recognised they were afraid of me, you know. Um, so I, I started, people started to question what I was doing and they were asking me to articulate it and qualify it and I couldn't qualify it. So that made me want to dig deeper. It wanted, made me want to go further. So I started to read philosophy and psychology. I did a master's degree in um, the psychology of martial arts and started and studied the endocrine system, studied that loop of adrenaline. I started to study like the psychology of stuff as well, like I said, and, and the philosophy. And that led me into the spiritual terms. Um, and not just the revealed books, you know, like you pick up a Bible, that's a revealed, that's what you would call the revealed Torah. Mm-hmm. I started to, re- to, to access the hidden Torah, the books beyond that. So you've got the Bible, which is just like a book full of allegories and stories to explain complex matters. But beyond that, you've got, you know, for instance, with with the Torah, with the Old Testament, beyond that, you've got Kabbalah. And beyond Kabbalah, you've got the Zohar and the Tanya and all of these uh, exegesis, all of these explanations of the hidden works, the esoteric works. And they're full of arcana. They're full of things that you won't get from picking up a book that says... um, you know, uh, the, 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 the earth was built in seven days. That, that's just an allegory. But if you go beyond that, if you go beyond that, you start to go into the hidden Torah or into the hidden martial arts, you start to see the magic. You start like with the hidden martial arts. I recognized when I was on the door that I was creating these monsters unconsciously. And then I was developing tools to defend myself against the very monsters I'd created and forgotten. I recognized I could use sound to wound people. I could use my voice and sound in a, in a certain way. I used to knock people over with sound. Just, and I used, to take, I used to make people time travel with sound. I would say, see you. I'm gonna find out where you work. You work at the Dunlop. I've seen you around. I'm gonna find where you work. I'm gonna come to where you work. Um, and then I'm gonna come and find out where you live and I'm gonna come to your house. You come into my front room. You're kicking off outside my door. I'm gonna come to your house. So I, would, I, would, I didn't know I was doing it, but I was literally lifting them out of their body, taking them to two days in the future and saying, this is the consequence of what you're doing here today. Um, and, and I'm going to show you the consequence and then I'm going to bring you back to your body and I'm going to use an exercise to flood you with adrenaline. So I'm going to use sharp dialogue, sharp sound. I'm going to use the, the, the shape of threat to trigger your adrenaline, to trigger the flight instinct, to, fig, to trigger terror, so you can see what, what the consequences of this are. So we used to, we used to really play around with sound. 
um, I said they call it Kotadama Gaku um, uh, in, um, in, Egypt, in, in Egyptology they would call it Heka again the use of sound, the use of magic sound so you started to re- understand the revealed martial arts and we found that what worked in a real fight yeah. so the revealed, mar- the, the, the revealed martial arts will teach you what, teach you what works in a dojo mm-hmm. the hidden martial arts will put you in an environment which will strip away on ostentation and show you just what works so we, we, we understood what worked so much that it was like magic. It was like you were working with people who had no idea that they were out of the fight before they even knew they were in it. Now, that was, wasn't very nice, but I, I needed to understand it. What I learned to do with that then was I used to learn, I used to use, later I would learn to use sound and touch, you know, like mudras and, and signals and um, sound to heal people, suggestion to heal people. Suggestion to project people into the future or to project people into the past to heal. So I've used exactly the same techniques, but not to harm people, but to heal people. Mm -hmm. So then I wasn't putting negative karma into the world. I was putting positive karma into the world. What did you do then after you stopped doing the bouncing? Well, it was interesting because what happened was I started to... Uh, tell, I was working in a factory as a floor sweeper and I started to tell the stories about the door to the guys on the factory floor over breakfast and one of my friends said these stories are great you know they're really funny and some of them are really serious and he said you should write them down and then it, I remembered I'd wanted to be a writer since I was a kid so I went and got some notepads from the stores and a, and a big biro and I sat in the toilet every day and I wrote my first book when people say they haven't got the facility to write or the time to write you know, you don't need many. You don't need many things to write a book. Mm-hmm. So I sat down and I wrote "Watch My Back." That was my first book. And of course, I realised I had no idea about how to publish a book. I didn't believe it was possible. So I had to really start to expand myself intellectually. I had to start to understand publishing, how to find publishers, how to present to a publisher. And then once I got a book published and realised it was possible, I started to go on the radio and on television. So I started to have to articulate and, and explain what I was doing to other people and then some of these people were massively educated so you just couldn't go on and, and and justify anything you had to qualify it they demanded it they demanded that you qualify they wanted to see your workings out mm-hmm. and if you couldn't qualify it you you'd soon be ridiculed on national mm-hmm. television so I started to really think oh, I want to understand this more so I started to really study became an autodidact I started to read more I started to train with the best people in the world I could train with. And I recognized if I could find the truth on the door, because that's what I did, I found efficacy on the door. You know, the martial arts is full, of, um, it's full of clubs that are teaching things that just don't work, but they're teaching it as though it does work. And I knew that, I knew that we'd been taught a lie. When I went on the door, you know, the environment just stripped away ostentation. It showed me the truth. It showed me the bare truth. And it was so obvious and so fundamental it was an insult but that piece of truth i found on a coventry nightclub as a club second dan rippled across the world right across the world i ended up being invited over to las vegas by chuck norris to teach over there who was he he was great yeah really lovely he sat me down we had a cup of tea and he told me about when bruce lee used to ring him up and Mm -hmm. say yeah you want to come and spa you know and he said, that when he asked me to do Way of the Dragon, he said, ah, so you want to be able to beat a world champion on film, do you? That's what, that's what you're after. We had a good laugh. Mm-hmm. But he said to him, listen, anyone could do this. How good was Bruce Lee? Um, His energy seemed like a whole different Tremendous life. energy. He was a, as a martial artist, I think he was phenomenal. And I think as an investigator, he was really investigating. I don't think he understood self-defense. I think he understood. I think he understood martial arts as being self-defense. But martial arts can be lots of things. It can be recreational. It can be sport. Mm-hmm. It can be art. But self-defense is a separate thing. And, and uh, with the greatest respect, I would say he didn't understand that. Uh, but what he did understand was power and dynamism. And he was the very first people to start saying, listen, we need to incorporate some judo in here. We need to incorporate some wrestling, some boxing. We need to incorporate other arts. Yeah. And he, he was a deeply philosophical guy. So I think he would have found all of that. He certainly inspired me anyway. Yeah. How do you think he died? Do you think that was a conspiracy? Or did you just think... He, some people say he was too fit as well. 
I don't, some really, of the I don't, feelings. I don't really. When I when I studied it, I studied him a lot when I was younger. He died from because he was hypersensitive to an ingredient in a prescribed Food tablet. Poison or something. No, or somebody he got a. I think he would got a headache, and one of his friends was on prescribed tablets, and he took a tablet, and they said he was hypersensitive to it, yeah. and that killed him. So, I don't suppose you'll ever know. All you can look at is what he left, and he left a legacy of, um, you know, he, he kind of left this legacy of. Um, potential you know because i think he would have found the way he was investigating his investig his investigative nature he would have found more and more arcana and he would yeah. have probably disappeared from public view is it but yeah because again that is an illusion as well isn't that the public because again there's another conspiracy theory to say that it was took out because he was uncovering a lot of things about energies and he was giving away secrets for like martial arts and stuff yeah. like that and he, because he, he was the first one to westernise it as well. He, came he was, America. yeah, it was, it's possible. It's possible, but it's one of those things. The problem with conspiracy is it's a rabbit hole. Everything's a conspiracy to yeah, me. I question yeah. everything. And if you, if you, if you want to look at conspiracy, you just come back to the self and just think, yeah. is it going to help me? Mm -hmm. Am I going to spend years looking for conspiracies or am I just going to come back and find out who I am? Yeah. So I don't get caught up in that because there's no way of us ever possibly knowing. But it's a rabbit hole that we can go down that will consume massive amounts of mm -hmm. energy so i'll just come back to the self all i'm interested in is i want i need one reference point my reference point to, my reference point to everything is the self it's the singularity so everything about my life is mm -hmm. about is about return refuge repentance in, in other words coming back to that center place um, and that's exciting because then you then you realize that everything Everything starts from that one point. It's the geometric point. In, in um, buildings, a geometric point is the point where it's the start point, the infin infinitesimal start point that a, that a construction starts from. Mm -hmm. So it might be like, a, like we, we start from a single-celled amoeba, and now we're trillions and trillions of cells big. We're like a universe. Yeah. So all I'm interested in is singularity. All I'm interested in is that geometric point. So if I'm ever lost and I ever fall out of alignment, which I do every day, I'll come back to the self, I'll come back to that singularity, I'll come back to who I am. And if I know who I am, if I know who it is that's looking from behind the veils, all the other stuff is, yeah. um, is just... So in your secondary. 30s, you really started working on yourself and your craft to be yeah. and work with the best people in the world. What kind of fighters and stuff were you working with then? Well, on the doors, I, I, what I realised was that I never, ever... Worked, I, I went off after the doors. I started to work with some of the best martial artists in the world and was personally trained by them. But I never ever learned more about combat than I did when I was on the nightclub door because the environment demands that you know the truth. What's the difference between martial arts and like, street fighting? Kind Efficacy. Of thing? Efficacy. Martial arts is a system and it goes off in all sorts of directions. But you know, what I recognized when I went on the door that um, I didn't need a system if I wanted to. If I wanted to win a fight, I just needed to use artifice and a big right cross. It took me through hundreds of fights. You know, it took all my friends through thousands of fights. So the art was in preemption, and the environment was the environment demanded um, everything to be stripped back, no ostentation. When you're standing in front of somebody that might kill you, believe me, ostentation falls off like a shed skin. So I recognise that all the other stuff, as as wonderful and as beautiful as it was. Um, was unnecessary for immediate combat. Immediate combat demanded um, uh, being able to control the endocrine system, being able to control their endocrine system, um, using artifice and being, uh, being able to hit first, having the courage to hit first and knowing where to hit. That took me through hundreds of fights. Um, so I found the secret to that. So the martial arts I went into were just... Um, you know, like I went into judo and wrestling. They, I just considered them to be backup arts. Mm -hmm. So if I made a mistake and, and it went beyond the first punch, then I'd got judo, I'd got wrestling, you know, I'd got all of those different arts I could work on. And I did those arts, you know, not to become a better fighter. I just did them because I loved the study of the art. Yeah. I trained with Neil Adams full time for 18 months. So I got five judo suits and went into an international class. And after 18 months, I could hold my own in an international class. But, um, you know, for the first six months, I got battered. You know, I got dropped on my head. I was, I just was, you know. In fact, Neil stopped the class one day and said, please, will everybody take it easy on Jeff? 
<laughs> I went to boxing. I trained with world class boxers. With world class boxers, I was on um, Scott Welsh's camp when he when he fought for the world title against Akawanda. Um, I was around judo players, was around Thai boxers, world class Thai boxers. So m- most of my friends, most of my immediate circle were all world class players, and I took private instruction from them. Um, but again, same thing. I love the art. I love the study of it. But all of it, all of it, I, I had so much physical in the mm-hmm. end. But it didn't change. Yeah. But didn't change. To, Sean, we talk about frequencies. You would never have been surrounded by them no. when you were a bouncer. No. Because they wouldn't have matched your vibration. No, you it's were true. Hanging around with other thugs, other people who wanted to fight, use the doors as an excuse to beat people up. Yeah. Then you started changing. Look what it's took you around the yeah. world. Look who it's the ab- people ab- you've connected absolutely with. Absolutely true. What you said yeah. is. Uh, um, Al Ghazali, a great um, Islamic um, teacher, said, "When we change frequency, we are noticed." And I love that we're noticed. Mm-hmm. If we fall into negativity, we'll be noticed by negative people or energies. If we fall into positivity, we'll be no- we'll be noticed. So every time I change frequency, a teacher has just appeared. I, I I had access to the best teachers in the world, and they wanted to train me free because I was in a frequency where it was irresistible to them. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain to me what is like a fifth dan, sixth dan? What is a dan? What is? So if your first dan is a black belt, so we okay. get a black belt. That's classed as first dan. And then up to fifth dan is classed as they're, they're classed as physical grades. Mm. When you get to fifth dan, it's supposed to be a master grade where you start tipping into internal martial arts or hidden martial arts. So fifth dan and above, it should be um, esoteric. So mm. it's the hidden, it's the hidden um, or hidden martial arts. But that, that that's not how it tends to work. But that's how it should work. So you, obviously you see lots and lots of people who are very senior grades, but they've still got big bellies and, you know, they've still got, you know, drink habits or they're still overeating or they're still addicted to stuff. So they're not really spilling into the esoteric. If you spill into the esoteric, you should see it in the person and you should feel it in their aura and it should be present in, in the certainty of what they do. So it's, this isn't to criticize them, but it's just to say that I was one of those people. I was going into the esoteric area and, I'm, and I just wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And that you know, so and training with people of all you know different arts and different ranks made me see that, made me realise I wanted more. I wanted to understand what the secrets of the martial arts were, and they were there, but they were hidden. And in order to get to them, you have to devastate everything that isn't them. You have to devastate the ego. There's a lovely saying from Rumi where he says, "The love is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation." And it takes us to the beginning of our conversation when you said to me. Um, I'm cleaning and I'm reducing, but it's painful. That's what he means. So you're, the self or, or God or singularity is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation. We have to devastate everything that is not love. We have to devastate everything that's not kindness. We have to devastate everything that is not center. And that is, it is absolutely painful. How do you sleep in that, Jeff? How's your sleeping patterns and stuff? I, I sleep really well. I've got a really good routine. Um, my, my day, my, my life is orchestrated and fully immersed in spiritual development. That's my whole life. Um, Gurdjieff would call it the work. I just do the work. So I get up about five. Um, I do some qigong, which is breathing. I meditate. Um, I have a bit of breakfast. And I follow a vegan diet. So... That's, that's purely because the energy I want in my body needs to be as pure as possible. Um, and then I write or I study all day, depending on what's going on. Then I meditate midday. Then later on I'll do some yoga and, and uh, meditate after yoga before I have my tea. Um, and although it feels as though you've let go of all of the things where people go, yeah, but what about all that stuff? What I found is that when I reduced all those things, the flavor's massively enhanced. And I reduced the need to consume, you know, all of these, necess- these kind of uh, rich things, you know, all the things that people are frightened to let go of. The, the flavor of everything I had became enhanced. So yeah. that was the secret. So the less I ate, um, the richer it became, the more I appreciated it. Same with sex. My sex is intimate and it's erotic, and it's beautiful, but it doesn't involve any imagery from anybody mm-hmm. else. It's just an intercourse of energy, an exchange of God for God with my wife. Mm-hmm. So I don't allow anything to come into that other, you know. See, that's what I struggle as well. It's, 
everything I would have girls, it's all been empty. There's yeah. been no connection. There's um and I always say it's sexual energy exchange, it's like plugging your phone in and yeah. or putting a, a like charging your charging your phone up or whatever it is, you're exchanging energies, you're taking on whoever you're sleeping with trauma, the people they've been with trauma yeah. and you're exchanging that. It's and, very true. Um, yeah. Even watching porn, there's scientific studies prove that if yeah. you watch porn every day, you are depressed. Yeah. You are lonely. You are insecure. And even people with father figures, if the, your father isn't there, girls are more likely to fall pregnant younger. Boys are more likely, increases their chances of going to prison. Yeah. There's so many different factors. But it's again, we true. can understand that because... Yeah. I kind of study it. I'm not a very good reader, but I'll listen to audio books or I'll watch um, videos on YouTube Same and thing, about it and I'll, and I'll pick up certain things and it just yeah. resonates with me and it feels good. The one thing I do, we talk about food, I struggle with food as well. Like I can eat good for three, four days and then I'll eat crap for three days. Yeah. This is something that I'm working on. I've lost over a stone. I just know I will get to where I need to be yeah. and it'll take me to another level. But there's... There's a barrier there for some reason when it comes to doing well and then self sabotage. Yeah. Even doing this stuff that I'm doing with the podcast and the documentaries, there's sometimes every day I think like going fuck it, because a lot of pressure comes with it as well, yeah, a lot of stress, yeah. and I'm dealing with it very well. But I worry sometimes that the self sabotage and I just rip the whole ceiling down and just destroy it all. Yeah. As well, that that, that can scare me as well. Yeah. So there's two personalities there. Yeah. So it's not it's not what you it's not what you're eating, James. It's what you're feeding. It's what is who you're feeding. Mm -hmm. So the part of you that wants to overeat is taking over. So the ego is going, yeah, he's had, he's had a tired day. Uh, um, he's feeling a bit stressed. I'll climb in and I'll take over. So he takes over your will. So your kingdom is lost. And during that time when you're, when you're taken over by that alternate personality, um, you might not just overeat or overdrink. If you open the door to... Uh, one negativity you open the door to them all yeah if you're if you've got a leak anyway you've got a leak everywhere mm -hmm. so you recognize that it's not you that's doing that but there's an element in you rising up you have to subjugate that you have to control that this is what gandhi did if you get a chance to read gandhi he built yeah, his well, whole empire mm -hmm. on pallet he said once you control the pallet he said you control the senses they fall into alignment once you control the senses you control the self when you control the self you control the world because you found your geometric point so the pallet a lot of people ignore it, but you've rightly picked up on it. We've got to get the palate right. So it's not what you're eating, it's what you're feeding. So I just eat a very, very light diet. Mm -hmm. I keep control of my food because once I let too much food in, other elements want to come in as well. Yeah. Have you ever heard of a thing called sun gazing? Sun gazing is looking directly at the sun. It might sound crazy for people, but there's people in India who do it. So everything that's grown from the earth that we eat, which is good for us, is like fruit, veg. That's the sun's reserves. Yeah. It's the sun that grows that. That's true, yeah. So we eat that, we're actually eating the sun's reserves. But there's people in India who actually cut out food and just look directly at the sun. Now, they say you go blind looking at the sun, it's yeah. a myth, it doesn't happen. But you must look at that an hour before sunrise or an hour before sunset when the rays aren't as strong. Yeah. You can build your eyesight up to it. So it's the main energy source. It's yeah. there for a reason. So they say when you look directly at the sun, it aligns everything back in your body. And if you can do it up to half an hour, you will be cured of all diseases and pain for the rest of your yeah. life it's a it is a powerful thing sun gazing mate check it out it's um something that's came across yeah. my path look the up, last I'll couple look of years like i say it is an energy source that we don't use people wear sunglasses and it blocks but, out but uh, what we mustn't forget is that uh, f forgive me sorry to interrupt that's you, okay uh, what we mustn't forget is that we can we can get distracted by that it's just Oh. I would, I would massively, massively encourage you to just keep thinking about mm. the center, keep yeah. thinking about the self, mm -hmm. and all of the things that are rising up, all the aberrations, overeating, anger, anything mm -hmm. that spills out, great, you know it's there, just get rid of it, yeah. just reduce it, and as you reduce it, you'll locate yourself in the self, you'll be, you'll be situated there, um, and then your consciousness will expand and you will be given access to other teachers, other resources, because you are seen as a stable energy if you can't control the food yet and mm -hmm. you can't control these angers you're seeing them which is a which is brilliant but if you can't control them you're not going to be given access to more energy because there, there will be a part of that will just at some point go fuck it and like you said pull the ceiling down mm -hmm. so the, that, this energy won't risk that it's got to, it would only come into a clean vessel so the more you can contract and get control of the palate and get control of these these other energies um, the, the more access you will get to influences and the more access you will get to resources 
Um, in Buddhism, they say you will be given two Dharma protectors, one here, one here, they're giants. Uh, they will protect you. They're real. They'll protect you, and they'll also uh, make sure that your uh, transport is provided. Mm -hmm. They make sure that your supper's there. They make sure your rent is paid. Um, these will appear when, as you start, you get this protection around you as you start to get more and more centered. So I would just really try to excite you with, with just do just like when I was on the door and I realized it was just about preemption. I let go of everything and I just worked on that and I became prolific with the self. Once I realized it was just about the self, mm -hmm. I just started to make my, that was my raison d'etre. All I did was work on the self, just work on re getting rid of everything that's not the self. And you get rid of it. It's not fancy. You just get rid of it, but not engaging it. Yeah. You seem in a great place, brother. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank What's you. your plans for the future? Uh, I can only tell you what I'm going to do in the next five okay. minutes. And that's going to, hopefully someone will make me a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah they will. <laughs> um, I've got, uh, <clears throat> I've just written a book called 99 Reasons to Forgive, which I'm going to, uh, I'm looking for a publisher for at the moment. Um, we've got a film about alcoholism. I lost my sister this year to alcoholism. Sorry to hear that. I lost my brother when he was 40 to alcoholism. Mm. All this stuff I know, and I couldn't help them. And you know why I couldn't help them? Because they, they didn't want help. Mm -hmm. I love them. That's all I could give them. I can help a stranger uh, more, like, more than I can help yeah. the people closest to me. Um, so we've got a film coming out called Three Sacks Full of Hats, uh, which is about alcoholism, which we're releasing... Um, on M Omeletto website in the next month or so. Uh, we've got this film in America with Orlando at the moment, Orlando Bloom, called, uh, it's called Retaliation in America. And that's getting massive reviews. They're comparing him to uh, De Niro in, in oh, uh, yeah. Taxi Driver. Yeah, he's got an Oscar for this they're talking about, possibly. Yeah, so, see, he deserves it because he's mm -hmm. brilliant. He was amazing in it. So that's ongoing. Um, yeah, and I'm just studying. I mean, I'm really yeah. enjoying getting up every day and studying. Mm -hmm. But same as you, I've got challenges. I've got energies trying to rush in me that I'm converting. Have you ever read Many Lives, Many Masters? Um, just remind me who that was by. It's, um, I think I have. It's about, I don't remember the name, but it's about talking about the pain of this life. If you don't sort out your pain and trauma of this life, you come into another life with the exact yeah. same stuff, but they yeah. add one on. I have Because we talk about um, your sisters and stuff, being an alcoholic, my yeah. auntie and stuff was, and I've got... We've, in the family, we've got bad gamblers. I was a bad gambler. Do you think it can pass down from generation to generation? It can be in your DNA as well. Yeah, absolutely. Some yeah. addiction issues. and yeah. um, They call it the genetic inheritance. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah or it's either a genetic mm -hmm. gift or a genetic curse. Yeah. Where can people get your books? Um, they can get the books through Amazon. They can get the books through good bookshops. Mm -hmm. um, the only place you can get me online is on i've got an instagram page jeff mm -hmm. thompson official and anything i'm doing new on there um uh, will be on that page yeah. jeff thompson official for anybody watching looking for advice maybe struggling maybe want to be a criminal or maybe battling with depression fear guilt anxiety maybe want to come forward and speak about their abuser what advice would you give for them i would just say just just be courageous and the thing that you're running away from you know you know every time you run away from it it grows it gets fat it gets really it gets fat on your fear instead of running away from it just turn into it embrace it this three-dimensional monster will become a two-dimensional cartoon and if you intercourse with it it will dissipate it has no reality if you don't engage it it has no reality it will take tremendous courage but i'm doing it james is doing it and there's lots of other people out there that are doing it. It's possible. We're showing you it's possible. It can be done, you know. And if you look at, um, if you look at uh, theology, you look at um, Angulimala, who was a Buddhist saint, killed 99 people before he, was, uh, before he turned to love. Uh, you've got um, St. Paul, who, was, who, was a, who wrote 17 of the books in the New Testament. He was a, uh, a murderer, you know, he crucified Christians before he turned. Um, if you look at Milarepa, a Tibetan saint, uh, they call him murderer turned saint. These are all people in our, in our holy books who um, lived extreme lives before they turned. The people who are living extreme lives have more potential for consciousness than anybody else because they know what it feels like at the other end and they've got lots of energy to convert. Mandela is a great example. Mandela was a terrorist. 
and he spent 30 years in jail before he realized that hate and war was not going to solve the problem of hate and war. When he came through the gates at Robin Island, he said, if I don't leave my hate here, it's going to come with me and it's going to permeate everything. Mm -hmm. he, his message went from bombing people to we've got to work with another level of energy. We've got to work with love. And he had lots of spiritual experiences. I met his bodyguard. I met his bodyguard in a serendipitous meeting, a guy called Chris Lube, and he told me of some of the miracles that happened to Mandela when he was being tortured. He told me Mandela was buried up to his neck in the mud and all the guards pissed on his head. And one of the guards took a spade to put it across Mandela's head. This is what Mandela told Chris. And this voice said to Mandela, don't worry, they won't be able to hurt you. He won't be able to touch you. And the guy, he just froze, he couldn't do anything. And they were going, hit him, kill him. And this voice said, don't worry, he won't be able to do anything to you. And he said he, Mandela had lots of spiritual epiphanies in there that showed him that love was the answer, kindness was the answer. It had to be muscular, you had to be able to make it work in the world. But he, he went, so all of these people are examples of people that went from lives of extreme crime into lives of benevolence and service. It's possible. Yeah, and that's what's, what's so great about life, no matter how dark your life is, there's always change, there's always light, and yeah. everybody's prime example. Your prime example, these people you mentioned are prime example, and it's a beautiful thing. For coming on today, brother, and telling your story, it's amazing. I think it's great what you've done. It's phenomenal, actually, everything that you've achieved, but there's so much more to come, Thank and you, I can't James. wait to see the rest you of too, your journey. Well, I'm yeah, watching, watching the space. Yeah, cheers, brother. Thank, thank you. you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.